have an Adam Selzer here. And we're thrilled about it. Um, a few points of order, uh, housekeeping, if you will. Um, I believe we have enabled auto closed captioning. Um, if not, we'll work on that. Uh, if you don't want closed captioning, then you can X out of that option. There we go. You can X out of that option. If you see the closed captioning and you don't like where it is on the screen, you can click and drag on it and move it wherever you would like. Um, the next thing is that this is a Zoom webinar, meaning you can hear and see us, but we cannot hear or see you. So you, if you have any questions, you can please feel free to submit a question in the question and answer section. And there will be a Q&A section at the end of this program. So, um, so we'll be available there and uh, trying to answer some of your questions at the end of the program. So we are thrilled to have Adam Selzer here. Uh, Adam Selzer is a historian, an author, and a tour guide based in Chicago. His books include H.H. H. Holmes, A True History, as well as The Ghosts of Chicago. And his new upcoming book is going to be about the Graceland Cemetery. So no stranger to spooky Chicago, which is perfect. And the whole reason behind why we reached out to Adam is because a new item will be available to Wilmette Library card holders. And that item is this ghost hunting kit. <laughs> And this ghost hunting kit is great for all ages. And I'm going to go through some of the items, actually all of the items that are in here. And um, just real quick to explain what you're gonna get when you check out these. So the first thing is an audio recorder for capturing electronic voice phenomenon, possibly. The next thing is a video camera, which when you set to night vision, you can usually catch some grainy apparitions. We have an electromagnetic frequency uh, detector to catch any fluctuations, any ghostly fluctuations in the electromagnetic energy of your haunting environments. And when you inevitably come to the conclusion or to the decision to split up in order to co cover more ground during your ghostly investigation, you're gonna need walkie talkies. So we have that inside of our ghost kit. So no ghostly investigation, no ghost investigation or hunting is complete without having done your due diligence and having researched the area that you're haunting. And this is Adam's specialty. So I am going to turn things right over to Adam so we can get started. And yeah. Hi, Hi hey, thanks, Linnea. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, everybody. See some familiar names out in the chat there tonight. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started properly here. You should see uh, at the moment, just a plain black box with a little mysterious Chicago logo at the bottom. You already saw Miles, the, uh, the, the who is also on the logo over there. So, all right, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Adam Seltzer. I run Mysterious Chicago Tours. I've been a tour guide and historian in Chicago for going on 20 years now and got my start in the ghost hunting business around here. Among my books are Mysterious Chicago, the book, H.H. H. Holmes, The True History of the White City Devil, a brand new one called Murder Maps USA, and Ghosts of Chicago, which is now a rare collector's item, <laughs> and uh, a new book out this August called Graceland Cemetery, Chicago's Stories, Symbols, and Secrets. Uh, I spent a couple of years digging through all of the files at Graceland Cemetery, trying to find all the best stories. I didn't come close. I'm still finding cool ones, including one that I'll be talking about today on this presentation. Um, but it's uh, as many words as they would let me cram in before I ran up on the word count. Um, so today what we're going to be doing is kind of a virtual ghost tour of North Shore ghosts, uh, primarily the North Shore area, a couple of just in the north side of Chicago. Really, it's almost all new material for me. I'm really fairly excited. I, I feel like, you know, I should be breaking out the greatest hits. 
Um, you know, the fans don't want to just hear the new stuff. But this is some interesting stuff for me. Uh, one thing I will point out, um, just to acknowledge, I also did a novel a few years back called Just Kill Me. It's all about a ghost tour guide who makes places more haunted by killing people at them. And there is a scene in the book where she has to do a ghost tour on a night when there's been a horrific shooting in the news. It's a very awkward thing. Some of the tour just, you have to just rearrange. Um, for the most part, I stick with stories that are very old and that's part of why, because it gets a little less awkward when things like this happen, which unfortunately they do all the time. Uh, this also makes it kind of difficult for actual ghost hunting that involves equipment and stuff though, because we're looking at stuff that happened a long time ago where the buildings have been moved around, the locations where the ghosts were said to walk no longer stand and also we're not really operating under laboratory conditions just to begin with um you know we're out in the city if you're using like an audio recorder to pick up strange voices it could be coming from just about anywhere but walkie talkies how cool is that i mean they're they're a lot of fun to play with don't get me wrong i love playing with these things but today once again we are going to be covering north shore ghosts and there was a time when sheridan road in particular was said to be about the most haunted place in the chicago Chicagoland metro area. Both the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Daily Inter-Ocean ran really big features all about the ghosts of Sheridan Road and the mysteries of Sheridan Road, almost all of which led to ghost stories. Uh, this particular one is an 1896 illustration from the Chicago Tribune. Uh, a few years later, the Chicago Daily Inter-Ocean, another paper, did this whole other thing, Chicago's Road of Mysteries Where Ghosts Hold Sway. Uh, both of them told largely the same stories. A lot of ghost stories had sort of grown up around the city, around the uh, areas of Evanston, Wilmette, and Winnetka in those days. Ironically, a lot of the stories they're telling don't actually take place on Sheridan Road. They're just kind of by Sheridan Road. You could, uh, if you were driving by in a carriage, you could point out if you go over there about 500 feet or about a quarter of a mile, but you know, 1896 and 1902, there was a lot of empty space still around the shore in those days. A lot of the houses that are standing now, even ones with the old brick roads are a little bit more recent than that. So what we're gonna do over the course of this tour is we're gonna start down at the uh, right of the border. Now, for the most part, Chicago ends at Howard Avenue, but underneath Calvary Cemetery, there's this one little section of Evanston that got absorbed by Chicago, the part that's cut off by the cemetery. Uh, they couldn't get a sewer with the rest of the Evanston, so they finally just uh, let Chicago absorb them. So we'll start out here at Calvary Cemetery which is occasionally said to be haunted. Not so much anymore. This used to be more famous than it is now. But over here, Calvary Cemetery goes right up to Sheridan and right up to the lakeshore. Now, starting in about the 1950s and peaking probably in the 1970s, people driving along this road would occasionally report seeing a guy come crawling out of the water covered up in seaweed who would walk across the, the road, uh, kind of hover around the bushes in front, of the, in front of the gates, then walk right through the gates and into Calvary Cemetery. They came to call him Seaweed Charlie. The uh, theory was that it must have been somebody who drowned in the lake. Sometimes he was said to be dressed in either a long overcoat or in a military style flight suit. Because of this, he was generally thought to be the ghost of a pilot who had died during maneuvers over Lake Michigan. And they've even occasionally specifically mentioned there was a guy by the name of Laverne Neighbors. In 1951, during the Korean War, he was flying an FH-1 Phantom uh, over the lake, crashed about 650 yards out, out um, close enough that people could still see him. People who were standing around at Northwestern could see him just fine. They watched him crawl out onto the wing of the aircraft, but then get swept away out into the water. And incidentally, four other people um, drowned while trying to recover the craft a couple of days later. Now, he's not actually buried at Calvary Cemetery. This He was buried in Minneapolis someplace. So if he's starting to cross the street to his grave, he's still got a really long way to walk. Now, you also notice the guy's name is Laverne, not Charlie. And this is just kind of a thing. Sometimes, you know, ghosts don't usually stop and tell us what their name is or anything. So we'll come up with names like this. A famous example of this would be Resurrection Mary, the vanishing hitchhiker that shows up around Chicago, primarily on the south side. 
Now, we've analyzed, uh, gone through genealogical records and newspaper records, looking up every girl named Mary who died between about 1915 and 1935, trying to figure out who this might be the ghost of. But even then, we're just making the very broad leap that it's actually a girl named Mary at all. As I've analyzed every firsthand account of this, there's not a good one where the ghost says what her name is. So it could have been Resurrection Gladys this whole time. Resurrection Mary just has a better ring to it. The same thing can happen with uh, things like Seaweed Charlie. Now, incidentally, there's another thing around um, Calvary Cemetery. One mystery I'm still trying to solve is back in the very early 20th century, there were still a couple of private graves in Chicago. By then, they had closed down all the like family cemeteries and most of the churchyards. There was just uh, one little convent on West Taylor Street where they were still allowing the nuns to be buried in the church grounds. So these were uh, semi-cloistered nuns. They were allowed to leave the convent for real emergencies now and then but not for something so frivolous as a funeral. So they were just still allowed to bury right where they were for a while. But then when they moved everybody up here to Calvary Cemetery, they found that two of the nuns had turned to stone. And that's the way they described it anyway. One of them specifically was Mother Galway was said to have turned to stone. She was one of the mother superior of the place. And it doesn't mean like she had like turned into a statue. It was like thousands of pounds of what appeared to be marble on the inside. But you can even see here within the uh, article about it, they've got some scientific explanations for how that would have happened. It's a very wet, marshy soil around Chicago. The uh, technical term for it is adipoker, which is a kind of a scientific way of saying you turned into cheese. We'll move up a little ways uh, further north from Evanston and get into one of the first places they used to talk about in those days. We'll just walk around Wilmette here a little bit. We're here on uh, John Street, if I remember correctly. And again, it can be kind of hard to find the actual addresses of some of these places. Some of them in their prime didn't really have a fixed address. You would just have the name and maybe the streets and uh, send it to the post office and they'd pick it up general delivery. But right about where this uh, driveway is now, just about here, used to be this house, which was the Wilmette home of H.H. H. Holmes, the devil in the white city guy. He's much more famous for his building that he had down on 63rd Street that was said to be a hotel that was rigged up with everything you could need to kill a person. That's a little bit more fiction than fact, honestly. But he is thought to have killed about nine people, nine or ten. Sometimes around Halloween, they'll say it's thousands and thousands. There's nine that we can be reasonably sure of. And in the summer of 1893, he built his wife, daughter, and mother-in-law this house up in Wilmette. And there were definitely rumors about it when people found out that this guy had killed people and that there were weird things all over his building on the south side. There got to be stories that he had hidden all kinds of secret passages and things around up here, too, or buried some bodies in the backyard, perhaps. Uh, one longtime resident in the 1940s said she remembered the family had a parrot that used to say, Ella, Ella, Ella. Who Ella was, she never figured out. And having dug through an awful lot of home stuff, I have no idea who the Ella might have been either. Uh, possibly one of Lucy, the little girl's friends. Now, Holmes wouldn't have actually been here very much. They built this place in the summer of 1893 using stolen labor and uh, construction companies that later sued him. It was actually built in the name of Minnie Williams, one of Holmes's girlfriends, who disappeared during the time it was being built. Eventually, uh, Murda, the wife who was living here got kicked out because Holmes wasn't technically the owner of it. But it was one of a few places that was rumored to be where he was stashing the bodies. There's at least five bodies that they never actually found. Um, another example, though, is another of, another of his places on the north side. We think of him as such a south side guy. But down near Damon Elston and Fullerton, on this little dead end track of Seeley Avenue, there's a place we used to call the body dump on ghost tours. Now, it doesn't look like this anymore. It's all been built over now. There's condos right where all of this stuff is today. But it's this little dead end street that goes up to a railroad track. You look like you, you, you we, we would pull a bus down here. It looks like here's the part of the tour where we drive you down a dead end street, then beat you up and take your money. Yay. So. It's a kind of a dead end place, but it, while they were investigating the Holmes building in Chicago, uh, shortly after the police kind of gave up on that place, it was announced that they had found another of his buildings right about where this sloping metal thing is, this garage. And it was a 150 foot long one story building that Holmes had said was a glass bending factory. 
Inside of the place, they found a wreck of a really long oven that ran the entire length of the place. Now, there's very little data about what he might have been doing there, but there's kind of a short list of things that a known serial killer might have been doing with a 150-foot-long glass-burning oven. So just going down there, we didn't really even start going down there thinking it was going to be a haunted place. We just went down there because it was creepy. People were asking about H.H. Holmes stuff a lot. This happened to be conveniently located on the bus tour route we were doing already. It's right near the Virgin Mary salt stain. Um, and when you went out there, there was this blood that always had this gunk that was dripping out of it. It's probably because this was a, a garbage dump for a long time, a scrap yard. So there's probably iron oxide got into the soil. But still, when you go to the body dump and you see a black branch with blood that keeps dripping, it's just creepy. But lo and behold, people started seeing ghosts here. We had no, one night we were pulling the bus here. This is maybe the scariest thing that's ever happened to me on a tour is we were driving the bus down here on one night when it was snowing and we hit something. And we, the bus was backing up at the time. I looked at the driver and said, oh, man, you hit somebody's car. I really hated this driver's guts. He was a jerk. Uh, and he said, no, no, it was just a tree which is exactly how he talked. The other guy in the back of the bus said, no, there was a woman back there. So I freaked out. I ran off of the bus, ran around behind, you know, hoping, hoping now we had just hit somebody's car or a fire hydrant or something, but there was nothing. There was nothing anywhere near the back of the bus. There was not a car. There was not a tree. There was not a fire hydrant. There was no footprints in the fresh snow either. And for a second, I really freaked out. The guy in the back of the bus swore he saw a woman back there. But I, I decided uh, after a couple of minutes, if we're going to kill somebody with the bus, it might as well be somebody who's already been dead since about 1892. Um, and now and then we would get some strange pictures here, too. We got this, uh, this woman took a picture you can see next to the woman who was wearing this uh, red hat. There's this weird black murky form. Now, I never hold these up as actual proof of the paranormal or anything. Something I say over and over again is there's no such thing as good ghost evidence. There's always something else that these things could be. There's a million ways to fake these things, too. Uh, what there is, though, is cool ghost evidence. And this I would definitely hold up as cool. There's also uh, the same night we got this thing with this mysterious shadowy figure right next to the serial killer looking van. And then there was this shot of a thing standing there behind the tree. Um, that's, that is the tree with the black branch with blood that keeps dripping or iron oxide. Anyway, now I was, um, in a larger version of the photo, you can see me standing over off to one side. So that's not just me standing behind there wearing what appears to be a bowler hat, just like H.H. H. Holmes would wear. Now, something about that place definitely gave me the creeps. I was there when they excavated it, uh, trying to, so they could build the condos. We found relics of the old glass bending factory, um, no dead bodies or anything like that. So that was a relief. But also when you're digging through these guys' stuff, you, you do get an idea of how the investigation into Holmes worked. The investigation in Chicago in the basement of his building was just like the cops poking around blind saying, oh, we found a rope. Maybe he was hanging people. Uh, we found uh, a hammer. Maybe he was bludgeoning people. And the same thing goes through your head. Like anything you dig, I was like a stick. I found a stick, like, like a stabbing stick. Probably it wasn't a stabbing stick. But there's another place that I've had a bit more trouble finding the exact location of. But it was somewhere down here on Lake, on Lake Avenue in Wilmette. It was said to be right next to the alley that went between, uh, that ran between 9th and 10th. So I think it was possibly about where this house is here, or possibly the next one down from it. I don't think it's the same house anymore. About the best picture we've got of it, well, it, the house burned down the night the story started but there was a house right about here just about matches here occupied by a guy by the name of frank wheeler now frank wheeler had his mother-in-law mary crone living in the house with him and one night he saw that there was a burglar in the house so you know, this being the North Shore, one thing they didn't realize in those days was that one pattern that I see in a lot of the stories as I read through them is North Shore residents were always ready to deal with a burglar. Even before they figured out the paint cans and red hot pokers on the doorknob tricks. Um, Mr. Wheeler ran after the burglar, shot one of the burglars dead, then realized there were two others. He chased one of them down the road. Then when he came back, he found that his house was on fire. 
Now, he already knew, uh, he said later, that Mrs. Crone, his mother-in-law, was dead. He had seen her lying in a pool of blood when he chased the other, ch as he chased the burglar out the door, but now the house was completely engulfed in flames. Uh, by the time they managed to clear it up, they weren't really able to find very much of Mrs. Crone's body. Now, this was a major story for a about three days. It didn't last very long, mainly because they didn't have any other suspects besides, beside the one guy who had already been shot. Um, and they never figured out what the motive would have been, why it would have, even if it had just been a, a burglary, they wouldn't have gone to this much trouble to actually brutally kill a person. There's even diagrams published in the papers there. Now, this is something I don't usually see in diagrams like this. Uh, 1890s newspapers love to have diagrams of the whole layout of the buildings. I guess, you know, they didn't have Zillow in those days. So they would have to, con uh, have to content themselves using diagrams of murder scenes. In this case, they've actually got a drawing of where the body was. I very rarely see that in something like this. More likely, it would be like an X marks the spot kind of thing. But the house burned to the ground. There was a rebuilt one on the spot that then was said to be the haunted house around the town for quite a while. In 1895, when they were investigating H.H. H. Holmes and realized he was a murderer, they noticed, hey, this was just a couple of blocks away. And for a couple of days, everybody assumed, well, that solves it. It must have been H.H. H. Holmes. But at the time, they asked Inspector Fitzpatrick, the chief detective in Chicago, if he thought Holmes might have killed her. And Holmes, he just kind of laughed and said, no, Holmes was a scientific killer. He would have never killed somebody like that. You might just as well connect him with the Jack the Ripper horrors in London as the Mrs. Crone one. Little dreaming that one day there would be an entire series of vainly attempting to connect H.H. H. Holmes to the Jack the Ripper horrors. Once again, I have a difficult time uh, triangulating exactly where this place was. There's a couple of different uh, descriptions, and they don't necessarily agree with each other. But also, like this is uh, Van Geem's paint store. Holmes and his wife went to a church that met above Van Geem's paint store. And you can see it doesn't even give the address. It's just Railroad Avenue opposite Depot. People didn't generally, people often didn't have, in rural areas, didn't have specific addresses. That can make these things very tricky. In particular, there was another one that starts down the road from here someplace. I've had the devil's own time trying to figure out exactly where, but both of those big Sheridan Road ghost story articles uh, told the same story, one that had been going around there for years of a time in fall of 1896, just a few months after H.H. H. Holmes was hanged, when a woman had a dream, a woman who lived right around this space started having a dream that there was a skeleton buried nearby. And according to a story, it took me a long time to find much backing for this, but the way that they told it in uh, these ghost story articles was that she had dreamed one night that there was a skeleton buried nearby and sent her husband out to dig. And her husband, Mr. Parker, went out and did some digging, got down a couple of feet, said, nope, didn't find anything. But then she kept having the same dream over and over and over again until finally she sent him back and said, no, dig a little bit deeper. And when he dig, when he did, he got down a couple more feet and found what appeared to be the bones of two women. Now, people remembered right away, H.H. H. Holmes killed a couple of women, Minnie and Nanny Williams. Maybe this was their skeleton. It was only a few yards away, a few like 100 rods from his house. I don't know how long a rod is, to be totally honest. Um, but that's the way it was reported in out-of-town papers. Look, looking up like the Daily, uh, the Daily Inner Ocean and the Tribune, I couldn't find anything about this one. But finally, I dug through the microfilm room and came up with a little bit. It, came, it turned out a little bit differently. This is one thing I always stress is when you're researching a story like this, make sure you get papers where the reporter is on the ground. Like if it's a story that takes place in Chicago, get the Chicago papers. If it's taking place in Philadelphia, get it in the Philadelphia papers. Otherwise you're getting a version of it that's like three rounds of a game of telephone away. Now in the Chicago papers, the ones that really did the investigating, they did find bones in the grave. Well, that's grave mystery. This is the Chicago Daily Record, which was a morning paper. And this one announced, it didn't say that she'd been having a dream over and over. It said that she and her husband had been taking walks around this area. And there was one part that she just kept having a premonition might be a grave. And finally, it got to be so much that they dug down and found a bunch of bones, including a skull. It didn't sound like two women in this one. There was just one particular skull in there. But by the afternoon, by the time the afternoon papers came out, the Chicago Daily News, they had cleared up the entire thing. No mystery there. Bones found in Evanston were those of a horse. 
And it was actually up in Wilmette, but she lived on Evanston Avenue, which was like what they carved that little stretch of Sheridan Road at the time. Now, it was got to be a kind of a wild story. The uh, police investigator who came out to look at the bones said that he figured out immediately that this was a horse. But some newspaper reporter had just written an article making fun of him for what a bad shot he was. So before he reported what he'd found, he went over to Northwestern, found a medical student, said, give me a human skull. I got an idea. So he dropped the human skull into the pit, then immediately called the reporter over, just attempting to make the reporter look stupid, hoping that the reporter wouldn't realize that there was a, mostly a horse skeleton plus a human skull mixed into there. And again, it uh, only la the story only lasted about 12 hours in Chicago. Very quickly, they had cleared up what it was. Later on, it said that it was said that the skull was now in a frat house someplace. Might still be for all I know. But the story endures. Uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, in a lot of these newspaper articles about the haunts of Sheridan Road, it was still getting repeated as though the woman had had the dream and found a human skeleton buried right near the home of H.H. H. Holmes. Um, this is the kind of thing, some, a lot of these stories got debunked early on, but then they kind of go underground, and when people remember them again, they forget that they got debunked, and often they've added a whole couple of other layers around them as well. Now, some of them, some of them there's a really good shell of a story, but it never really came out to too much. Like just up the road here at Sheridan and Ashland, now just on the other side of the fence, of course, is the lake. And if we turned our back over to about uh, Ashland and Ninth, we would come to where the old country club was back when it was uh, back when it was the Will Met Club spelled with an O. Now, one day back in 1903, some members of the club were making their way up there and one by one, they kept passing a broken down carriage by the side of the road. Like even after one of them would stop to help them fix their tire. Another customer would come, another person would come along and they'd still be broken in the side of the road. Now, this was a carriage run by a couple of uh, nervous looking men, and everybody who passed it noticed the same thing that in the back seat there appeared to be a dead body. It was, uh, they thought it was a woman's body, all wrapped up in a shroud, but seated upright on the seats as though it were just taking a ride. Normally, you would have a the kind of body like that that would have been put in a coffin or at least laid down. Now, some people thought it might be a murder or something. Some people thought it might be a ghost. Eventually, the carriage disappeared. They, the next day, this was front page news, as you can see. They checked with every funeral home in the general vicinity to see if a body like that had been delivered, but nothing had. So as far as anybody really knew, it was probably somebody trying to get away with murder. They never did solve that one. And there's a couple that I myself has never, have never solved. Even when those ghost story articles from 1896 through the early 20th century named names specifically, sometimes it's really hard to verify stuff. For instance, there was one story that one of them told about a guy named William Lampert near Kenilworth Station. And I've had difficulty figuring out if he was a real guy or if they got his name wrong or what, but they told a story that he ingested poison one day and lost his mind and was found writhing around in his death throes, tearing up the grass over by Kenilworth Station. And they said that thereafter, there was one spot where he had torn up that after he died, grass would never grow there again. It's the kind of ghost story you hear now and then. So I, I, I triangulated it to this place just because there is a patch where there's not actually grass growing. It's just the landscaping. These things you don't usually last forever and ever. Um, but I had difficulty verifying whether that uh, guy ingesting poison and tearing the place up or if there even was a William Lampert in the area. There's also different spellings, Lamport, Lambert. Uh, I haven't really gotten it down yet. Still working on that one. There is one grave in Kenilworth that people might not really know about. But over in the Holy Comfort Church is the poet Eugene Field and his wife have a whole little cemetery all to themselves. Field was known as the poet of children. He wrote, uh, he was best known for Wink and Blinken and Nod, which is still read sometimes. He was initially buried over at Graceland Cemetery, then got moved here eventually. As he shares it with his wife, Julia, he wrote a whole poem about Julia called On Julia Unlacing Herself, which is all about how much he loved his wife's farts. Uh, he himself is also, just to keep things light, the uh, poet who published a poem that was, the, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the first use of the word poop in his modern noun and verb forms. And he gets the whole churchyard all to himself. I love that. Let's move up to Winnetka a little bit, up to uh, Tower Park. 
You can see this old electrical power station tower over here, which would probably be just a little bit to the east of the old tower for which uh, Tower Road gets its name. It's a cool little park with these MC Escher looking stairs all set up. Just spin around so you get a bit of a look of where we are. So up here in Winnetka. So back in 18, this is another story that came up quite a bit in those, uh, those early articles, early ghost articles. It shows here, there's a vision of the tower, what it looked like back in the old days. It was kind of a known landmark of the space back then. But when I scroll up, you can see the caption, where the headless body was found. It was 1881, some kids playing on the beach down over here found a human head on the shore. And they went to alert the authorities. By the time the authorities got there, it had been swept back into the water. So they never even really thought to hold an inquest. But a couple of months later, a headless body was found over in this general vicinity. It was it said to be like a couple hundred yards from the water tower. So about where we are right now. So it was a very well-dressed headless body. It was dressed in fine German clothes. There was some German printing on one of the labels, just happened to be missing his head. A very clean cut, uh, given the lack of blood, probably made after death. And probably when you cut somebody's head off, it's usually to disguise the identity so no one will find out who it is. Um, once it was discovered, they didn't really even do much of an inquest or anything like that. They uh, just hauled it over to the police station where many people remarked on the fact that it was in really bad shape and uh, in fairly disgusting condition. The coroner didn't even really bother to hold an inquest at first. He just buried it right over about where Hubbard Woods Park is now. Now at the time Hubbard Woods was an actual woods that spread all the way out to the lake. Once again, we're on the set of Home Alone here. This is where Kevin runs away after stealing a toothbrush from the place where the Grater's ice cream is now. But the body would have been buried, I think, just a little bit south of this. But it was only there for a couple of days. There was quite a bit of backlash. There was uh, this article published saying these people, the, these people are very inhuman or indisposed about this region in Winnetka. So they dug it back up and matched it to another head. They never found the one that washed up on the shore, but they remember that a couple of months before somebody had found a human head, probably the remains of a medical cadaver down on the south side of Chicago that had been buried out of the potter's field at Dunning. So they dug the head back up, dug this body back up, decided they looked like about enough of a match. So they did some tests on the, they put the, took, finally took the clothes off of the body, soaked them in a well long enough that they would eventually be able to read any of the labels. And then buried the body with what was almost certainly the wrong head. So the body was later identified as a guy by the name of Ignaz Hopf, who was a mayor of some town in Germany. But that was just one identity. There were a couple of other suggestions as to who it might be the body of. They never figured out, I think, 100% for sure who the guy was and certainly never figured out who the murderer was or why they went so far as to cut off his head, which would have been fairly unusual in any of these cases. But naturally, there were stories about a headless ghost walking around. And I just love that. I'm, I'm old fashioned. I like my coffee hot, my beer cold and my ghost headless. It was said to wander around, presumably looking for his head and possibly mad that he had been buried with the wrong head. I don't blame him. I hate it when that happens. Now, this seems to have uh, like a lot of these old time ghosts. I don't know if anybody's seen this in a long time now, but now it's all been built up. All the places where it was supposed to walk are now houses around Winnetka. So there's always a chance somebody could just be lying in their bed and the closet door will open and out will come a headless guy trying to find his head. Also, it's worth noting the population of Winnetka at this point was about 500. So this means that um, people were being decapitated and buried in the, with the wrong head at a rate of about 200 people per 100,000 citizens. And that's just, uh, that's just this one. The murder rate must have been enormous at the time. Not too far away, it was often noted that if the headless ghost wanted company, he could probably find some right on the shore. Though stories differ a little bit as to whether it was north or south of where the headless body was found. And this is another one that's fairly tricky. That down around the shore, it was said that they would see off on one of the piers, they would see a young woman walking up and down the pier, wringing her hands and looking distraught. She would walk up and down and up and down a little while 
and then just kind of vanish into nothing. Now, both articles gave her the same name. It said it was the ghost of a girl named Annie Russell. Annie Russell was said to be one of the bells of the North Shore, one of the most beautiful women around, had any number of suitors, but there was only one man that she wanted. And when that man didn't want her back, she walked off and jumped off of the pier. This is another one I've had difficulty covering. I haven't been able to verify whether Annie Russell was even a real person or what year this actually happened. Both of the big Ghost Art Ghosts of Sheridan Road articles from the old days gave the same name, but I haven't been able to verify it. They might have been, it might have really been just a couple a little bit off from that. Might have been Anna. Well, I, I've looked up Anna and Nanny and many of the variations. Um, there was an actress named Annie Russell who was very popular at the time, which further muddies the waters. In any case, people said that they were seeing this ghost there. So if the headless person wanted some company, he didn't have too far to go. And we'll just stick on the lake shore for a second here. For one of the other uh, well-documented but lesser known ghosts. And this might also have been the pier where Annie's ghost was said to be. Kind of reminds me that there's a story called Annie's Road in New Jersey. There's a section where a girl was supposed to be have been killed on prom night and now haunts the place. Very similar to our resurrection, Mary, but it hasn't been researched nearly as much. I don't think anybody's come up with a good historical who that Annie was. But right here along the lakeshore in Winnetka was also a uh, part of the stretch where the wreckage and the remains of the ship, the Lady Elgin, washed ashore in 1860. 1860, the steamer, the Lady Elgin, was sailing from Milwaukee to Chicago, but there was storm clouds and bad visibility. It ended up colliding with another much smaller ship. The other ship was okay, but it punched a big hole in the Lady Elgin, and within half an hour, it had sunk before they could get too many people into the lifeboats at all. About 300 people were killed. Most of the remains, well, the remains washed up everywhere from Winnetka way down to the south side of Chicago, but the primary portion of the remains would have been over in the Winnetka vicinity. In fact, this is a picture from 1897. The wreck, while well, some of the wreckage was still on the shore nearly 40 years later at the time. Now, most of the bodies, they, a lot of the bodies couldn't be identified. Some of them were identified and buried in family plots. Um, 27 unidentified ones were buried at a, a plot in Rose Hill Cemetery that is now kind of lost to history. But most of them were buried in a burial ground up in Highwood, which within 40 years was completely lost. Nobody remembered exactly where it was anymore or all that there was left was a couple of stakes in the ground and cows had kind of uh, desecrated all of the rest of it. But at the time that people were first starting to wonder where is the cemetery anyway, it also gave people an occasion to talk about a ghostly woman who showed up there. It was a woman in black wearing a gold necklace who would wander around at the shore dripping with water and looking like she was trying to wave people off, like she was trying to keep them away from a certain space. And one of the guys interviewed for this article about the cemetery said he knew exactly who it was the ghost of. He, he didn't know her name or anything, but he was one of the first people on the scene when the body started to wash ashore way back in 1860. And he remembered there was one particular woman who washed up a few days later than the rest. And they said that she was uh, wave tossed and beach blasted, but you could tell that she was once beautiful, uh, wearing a black dress and gold necklace and uh, diamond earrings. So they took her to a nearby building and laid her out overnight. Uh, when they came back in the morning, the necklace was gone. All of the jewelry was gone. He mentioned that he saw the necklace being worn on the neck of the wife of a city, a Lake County official a couple of weeks later. Um, but because the jewelry was missing, they didn't really have any identifying marks left and her body was never identified. She was buried in a slightly nicer coffin. He built it himself uh, than a lot of the others, but buried up here someplace in Highwood. And that presumably would have been the ghost still showing up years and years later. Now, incidentally, nobody seems too sure these days where exactly in Highwood this was. The Highwood Historical Society um, published a newsletter a few years back where they said that they had figured out where the location was, but that PDF is no longer available online. So it's kind of a it's kind of remaining a mystery to me. It looks like I got time for about one more, the one more big one. Now, one thing you see a lot if you look up like one page histories of Winnetka is it mentions that it used to be called Murder Town. That's kind of a stretch. There was one particular story in 1884 that made such a splash that for a while people called it the Murder Town. 
at least according to things like 60 years later. Then in the 1990s, people decided that that had been an actual general nickname for Winnetka, which frankly, it might as well have been. Again, I keep finding murder stories from there from a time when only about 500 people lived there. The murder per capita rate must have been just it, off the charts. So over here, just west of the railroad track, just east of the railroad tracks, was the original location of the James and Clarissa Wilson house. It would have been somewhere up over here. And again, it's difficult to triangulate exactly where the house was moved a few years later. But almost miraculously, we actually have pictures of this one. And this just looks like it ought to be a haunted house. And people definitely had stories about it being haunted, about a bloody handprint still being on the wall. But I'm getting kind of ahead of myself here. So it was back in 1884, an old uh, village president named James Wilson lived in the place. This is him, roughly age of 65 or 70, with a huge, long, white beard. His wife was a decade older than he was, which was kind of unusual back then. But he was um, not even retired yet. He did a lot of painting, but he was still a businessman. His wife, Clarissa, seems to have been really interesting. She was heavily into politics, knew everybody's vote on everything. Uh, in particular, there was a paper at the time, the Chicago Times, ran by old man, run by old man Wilbur F. Story, the Copperhead Chicago Times. This guy loved slavery so much. One day somebody brought Clarissa Wilson a uh, gift, some baked beans wrapped in a sheet of the Chicago Times. When she saw it was the Chicago Times, she threw the whole thing, beans and all, into the fire. My kind of person. But she was losing her mind. She had, uh, was uh, lapsing into dementia in her mid-80s in 1884. And like there was a story going around recently, she'd been wandering around collecting all the eggs she could find because she thought they were made of gold. So Every Wednesday, James Wilson would go down to Chicago to do business, and a woman named Emma Dwyer, a neighbor, would come in to keep uh, Mrs. Wilson company. He would leave the door unlocked for her. But this day, she showed up, and the door was locked. And for some reason, she just got the idea that something was wrong. So she went inside of one of the windows and saw this horrible scene. Now, these, uh, these pictures came from a video that was published from the Winnetka Historical Society. It would be really unusual for there to be actual photos of a crime scene like this from 1884. Not impossible, but really unusual. So they found uh, Mr. Wilson himself had been, it was uh, dead behind the, was the whole place had been ransacked. Mr. Wilson was dead behind the stove over here. And upstairs, Mrs. Wilson had been killed with her late son's civil war sword, which had been mounted up on the wall. Now, one of the uh, 1950s books, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up really quick, Linnea. Um, one of the 1950s books about Winnetka history made this connection. It's like it all goes all the way back to 1619. In 1619, they brought the first enslaved people to the United States. That led uh, 240 years later to a war over them. And then 25 years after that, uh, one of the swords from that war was used to kill Mrs. Wilson. Now, no motive could really be discovered. That morning, Mr. Uh, Wilson had gone to a butcher and said, I have a good friend coming over and I want a really good piece of meat and then another porterhouse delivered for breakfast in the morning. And he had gotten the meat and when they uh, investigated the place, the table was set for three. He was definitely expecting a visitor to come. But whoever came uh, was not really a friend. The suspicion fell on the butcher himself, a guy by the name of McKeague. And again, this is from their video. I assume it's actually McKeague. I'd have to I'd have to double check with them on that. But and the trial is really interesting. There's all these uh, little slices of life of what life was like in Winnetka at the time. Stories about playing cards at the pop shop or going on sleighing parties. He was about the only suspect they had, though the uh, evidence was all circumstantial. He had a, there were a couple of buttons that they thought might have been his, some hairs that they thought might have been his. But this was all about 15 years before that kind of forensics were going around, uh, 30 years or so, 40, 30 or 40 years before they would start using um, fingerprints as evidence, and much longer until DNA. Nowadays, we could clear up whether it was him or not, at least fairly, fairly easily. But he was acquitted. And about two years later, he was shot to death over a card game at a place in Church's Ferry, North Dakota, which Church's Ferry, North Dakota sounds like the kind of town that would only exist so people would have a place to be shot during a card game. 
And just one other quick one really nearby. There were most of the ghost stories about it later on revolved around a bloody handprint that was found on the wall down over here someplace. I wouldn't be surprised if they got pictures like this, if there's a photo of it someplace. But it ties into a trope of folklore, you see, the handprint or the blood stain that never washed away. You see it come up now and then within Chicago folklore. And one other really quickly one, I think still standing, the Harold Lloyd home for me, uh, originally built in 1855 when the journalist Harold Lloyd, whose son was the founder of the Communist Labor Party, was living here. They would see a ghostly old woman just wandering around, going up and down the stairs, in and out of the rooms, looking very busy. But she didn't bother them one bit. They didn't seem to mind her. They moved the house and wondered if that would make the ghost disappear. But she still showed up. Not as much, but still every now and then. But that gets us right on through. So we go, before I go to uh, questions, just really quick, I'll give a quick plug. Thursday night on the Epping Chicago Facebook page, I'll be giving a talk about H.H. H. Holmes. Epping Chicago is a collective of Chicago tour guides behaving badly. We're allowed to swear, dress however we want, um, make all the jokes that the corporate tour guide companies do not allow us to make, etc. My next in-person walking tour is uh, Prairie Avenue, Splendor and Scandal down in the South Loop. Go to MysteriousChicago.com for all the information on both of these. And with that, I will turn things over to Linnea for her questions. Hey, yeah. So Adam, you have your Mysterians have been here yeah. chatting with I see. I saw other. some, uh, I saw we had some uh, familiar names out there. <laughs> Drinking to H.H. Holmes. Every time I mention him, they take a drink. Yeah. <laughs> but it's in um, context of that. I'm just randomly bringing him up. It is, right. exactly. Um, we had, uh, Someone named Sarah asking if Tuttle House was in Hubbard's Hubbard Woods. The Is Tuttle that House. The Tuttle House. Tuttle House. I'm not sure. I'd have to look on. I'd have to look for that one. Um. Everybody can go ahead and ask their questions. We have one, which was you mentioned historical societies a lot as like mm -hmm. uh, kind of the documentation that you've got. Uh, what other kind of resources references do you find? Do you visit libraries? Well, most <laughs> yeah, libraries for sure. I, know, I remember the Wilmette Library has a microfilm reel of the North Shore News that I'd like to check out for a couple of these stories. I don't know how far back it goes. Uh, for a lot of these, you just have to go with the Chicago papers, but some of them, I know that there were, I know that there were definitely like the North Shore News and I think the Evanston News had their own paper that haven't been digitized yet. You got to go to places like the Wilmette Library and dig through the microfilm reel. And that's a lot harder than doing like a text-based search where I can just uh, type in somebody's name and see what comes up. But what we can do is we can look at the Chicago papers and at least see which dates to look up. Like we know which date the Wilson murder took place. We know what date the Crone murder took place. We know what date they found the headless body. Uh, so if we poke around like that uh, on those dates, you might, you'll, you'll, you'll find probably some really interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, the next question is slaying parties, like a slaying, sleigh? like like you know, like lovely weather for a sleigh right together. Oh, okay. That kind of slaying, <laughs> not not like slaying. Yeah, we had other. Yeah, we were, we were wondering. Well, you know, slaying. given it was Winnetka in the 1880s, it might as well um, been a slaying party. Murder right? town. Yeah. <laughs> Gonna put up that Kevin McAllister gif again. Um, have you checked out the Harley Clark House in Evanston? Um, I must have been there at one point or another. I don't know about the hauntings of it. And then, oh, I've got a good one. What made you so interested in doing what you do, Maria is asking. Scooby-Doo. I mean, I mean, I'm supposed to have a good origin story for that. Whenever I do like the talking head work, they want me to have, the, I never believed in any of this stuff until one day. <laughs> but, you know, for me, it would be like one day I turned on channel nine and there was a show called Scooby-Doo. <laughs> uh I, good voice good voice. Dri driving around in a van solving mysteries that sounds like the life for me is that what is that the footage that you've got it looks like it was like shot by you Did that you was mo the uh all of the video footage there yeah it was just me the last few days walking around uh if you if you saw a guy with a camera walking around Wilmette or Winnetka the last couple of days yeah that was me do you have a scooby-doo van no, I just have I have a I have an orange Prius, but it's it's the mystery machine anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, have you tried the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps to help with locations? The Sanborn Fire Insurance maps uh, only help if they have them from the right date. And generally there'll be a map for each individual location, like maybe in one or two specific years. Sometimes they help and sometimes not. But sometimes they do. 
they're a pain in the neck to find what you're looking for in. Yeah. But I have definitely used them, sure. So that was Allison. And then Allison had another question. They're in Mount Greenwood on the far southwest side. Do you ever research this area? Um, I'm sure it's come up occasionally. But no, the library out there hasn't asked me to do a ghost tour for him yet. So, are there any programs on TV that you feel are are like kind of close to real? Like, yeah, I don't really watch too much of them. The first, there were a couple of seasons of Ghost Hunters where I felt like they were really trying to be accurate and um, not just pure entertainment. But other times, they've definitely lapsed into that kind of thing. This case was um, kind of based on like the 2005 era. Of yeah, that, that's about the era that you want to watch for them. The ones where they're not just saying every every lens flare is definitely a dead person up and walking around. They're not just running around like, come at me, bro. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or the, they're not trying to claim everywhere they go. I heard a ghost saying, get out. They're always saying, get out. That's never happened to me. I keep waiting for it to. It's like, you get out. You're the one dead. It would be spooky. Yeah. We head into the light or something. Uh, let's see. Another question would be, have you, is there any hauntings related to the Edmund Fitzgerald? The Edmund Fitzgerald, there probably are. I mean, there's a lot, been a lot of shipwrecks out in the Great Lakes. Yeah, you hit on a lot of them. And I'm so, it's so cool. The nautical hauntings are really yeah. fascinating. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's, I can't take a bus out to where it would show up though. So there probably <laughs> are. The there's all, if there's, where there's a shipwreck, there's probably a ghost story. Very cool. What else? Any hauntings about the water crib fire in around 1909? Ooh. Uh, not, that, nice. not, not that I know of. It's Allison cool with another zinger. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. I don't know about any hauntings related to it. It would be very convenient for me if it did. What What is the water crib fire? Uh, the water crib is like you? out, you know, where they would have like the treatment plants and stuff where people would just kind of live there and they could get, you know, now and the, it wasn't the most, it wasn't the safest place to be. Mm. Now, what I would like to know about is, um, you know, the, the mile long tunnel. When they built the, wa the water tower downtown is to pump water through a mile long tunnel. In the 1860s, they figured out, you know, we're all getting cholera from drinking this lake water. But if we get it from a mile out, maybe the cholera germs won't have gone out that far. They didn't know what a germ was just yet at the time. Right. Um, but, they, you know, the water was a lot clearer out there. So they dug a mile long tunnel. But while they were in the process of digging, one of the construction workers killed one of the other ones. So literally, the drinking water was being pumped through a murder scene thereafter. But if it was haunted, who would know? Because who went into the tunnel? Yeah. Were there any historic relocated cemeteries on the North Shore? Something similar to Lincoln Park? Uh, pro mostly, it probably would have been a lot of uh, family plots that got moved. And then there was also, you know, the ones from the Lady Elgin someplace in Highwood, um, probably quite a few more cemeteries like that. So Maria asks, how long does it usually take you to kind of dig up all your information for a presentation like this? Um, it depends on how much I already know about the, about the material. These ones I at least, most of these I at least had some files on and a general idea. So really mo it was more getting everything organized than anything else for this one. But yeah, it was easy to like dig up, you know, more things. Since I last looked up the headless guy in Winnetka, a lot more papers have been digitized. So I can find a lot more gory details about that one. And I love a good headless ghost story. Yes. Any good headless ghost stories in Graceland Cemetery? Uh, I don't know about a headless one in Graceland. Okay. I wish. Do you have a favorite one in Graceland? Yeah, you know, there aren't really that many ghosts in Graceland, oh, okay. um, relatively speaking. I mean, the people tell stories about Inez, the girl in the glass case, dis uh, the statue disappearing, or a strange ghoul guarding the grave of Ludwig Wolf. It's probably just a pun on his name. But, you know, it's definitely uh, among Graceland, whenever, like, the lights flicker or something, the, the staff will blame it on Inez, the girl in the glass box. Oh, that's good to know. Do you ever find yourself using 
ghost hunting equipment yourself? Um, if I'm checking out a location, I'll definitely be taking some pictures. Um, or usually I'll walk around with the audio recording gear just to see what happens. I don't necessarily expect to get anything, but now and then something cool will be on the recording. Um, I don't do it as much anymore, but back when I was in that business, you know, it is a good way to get access to historic location. Now, you're apt to find plenty of stuff besides just haunting stories in these things. But it was a good, going ghost hunting was a good way to get into buildings I never could have gotten access to before. That's interesting. I would think that they that some people would kind of freeze up and be like, we don't want that. it can go. It can definitely go either way. But others are like, whoa, you go ghost hunting. You want to come hang out? I, I manage this one building. You want to come like do a stakeout? And then, you know, that's great. But if they if they then show up with a six pack, you know, oh, this is not going to be a scientific investigation. <laughs> yeah, I bet. What is the scariest encounter you've ever had? <laughs> curious for me was that that one at the body dump where we thought we hit somebody with the buzz. I mean, we hit something. I felt the impact. Spooky. All right. Let's see. Any more questions? Hold on. Someone is going on a Allison's going on a Prairie Avenue home tour in a few weeks. Do you tell stories of those homes? Uh, well, yeah, and, uh, next on Sunday the 5th, I'll be doing a Prairie Avenue tour. We won't be going inside of them. Uh, this more story, the publisher of the Chicago Times that I mentioned hating so much actually died on Prairie Avenue in a house that no longer stands. Oh, that's cool. My favorite um, thing he ever did. <laughs> uh, 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 oh, yeah, I was thinking when with a lot of your stories, they kind of are mixed between like water deaths or mafia, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, for, for this one, it's definitely going to be a lot of water deaths. You're right on the shore. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank oh, you nice. so much, Adam. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming with us. And for everybody who's attending right now, um, if you liked this event, we encourage you to come and check out our program on Thursday, July 21st at 7 p.m., where author Carolyn Campbell discusses her new book, City of Immortals, Père Lachaise Cemetery, Paris. And so some fun cemetery, additional cemetery talk. Awesome. It's going to go on there too. All right. So we're going to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your night, everyone. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.